America, it's time for some straight talk. You love your phone. Look at you. You hardly put it down. But you don't love that expensive wireless plan, do you? So what if I told you you can keep that phone, network, and number two for a lot less? Well, this is me telling you, it's time to switch to straight talk, guys. Bring your own phone and get unlimited plans starting at just 45 bucks a month on America's largest, most dependable 4G LTE networks. Straight talk wireless, only at Walmart. Savings may vary. Please refer always to the latest terms and conditions of service at straighttalk.com. Clean up a couple of things from our previous conversation. I was right. Andrew Luck did have the option of coming out the year before he did. He stayed at Stanford one more year, of course, was the number one pick in the draft. Had he come out the year before, it was the year that Cam Newton Went to was Carolina. the number one pick. Right. Okay. So, you know, quarterbacks going and staying. And, and here's a little bit from that article that I, I, t- I mentioned in which the people around Sam Darnold, who, again, I had every intention of all through this football season, I'm going. I was planning to refer to him as future Jets quarterback Sam right. Darnold. Mm-hmm. He's he's not USC quarterback Sam Darnold. Mm-hmm. He's future Jets quarterback Sam Darnold. But now he may not be future Jets quarterback Sam Darnold because he may spend two more years at USC. That's some of the speculation around him. But as far as how good he is, Daniel Jeremiah wrote uh, for NFL.com. I don't want to get carried away. This is quoting one. Um, One evaluator, I don't want to get carried away with one season of production, but Darnold is a special talent. He has a lot of similarities to Andrew Luck when Luck was at Stanford. One Pac-12 coach has compared Darnold to to Tony Romo, and I see some of that as well. Yeah, listen, he looks like he has all the goods. We'll see. And and like I said, I'm holding off on, on right now someone saying that a kid who's potentially the number one pick in the draft is going to be back for his uh, year after that. We'll see. Maybe. It has happened before. I'm with you. But let's see how it all plays out. Then I mentioned earlier that I don't fully understand how the value of a franchise can increase from $450 million to $2.6 billion as the value of the Warriors has since the current ownership group bought Mm -hmm. them. And yet they're worried about paying $40 million in luxury tax. It just just strikes me as an insignificant comparatively to the, the you know, if, you, even, even right. if your operating margins aren't exactly what you want them to be, aren't you more than making up for that on the other end? So my friend Mitch Truitt, who is a very smart business guy. So since, you say. He's Do very really smart. know that? There's no question he's smart. Okay. And here's how smart he is. He wrote me an email explaining how this works that loses me in the first sentence. First sentence, I'm lost. If an owner bought a team for $500 million and the team produces enough cash flow to serve his debt, might be hypothetically the owner only used $250 million of equity and borrowed $250 million. Corporate debt is inexpensive, so maybe paying 5 to 6% interest. Any increase in franchise value accrues to equity. So your comment may have been something to the effect. I've, I'm lost. Here's the thing. I'm I lost. I don't think he's that smart. He's a guy that's trying to sound smart to make use big quarter words out there. No, this means to something. Lose, to lose us in the conversation, which I was was lost earlier than you were lost right but he's just throwing big words out there i contend he's not as smart as you give him credit for. i think there are people to whom what i just said made sense yeah now this should give you some indication of how not smart we are because we're just two sports guys we've been sitting here all these years but i don't understand what that means but lots of people probably are shaking their heads going yes that makes all the sense in the world mm-hmm. your comment may have been something to the effect of if the franchise is now worth two and a half billion the owner has made five times his investment if the owner used 250 million of leverage he or she would make 10 times on the equity investment hence the 40 million dollar loss which may very well include the cost of debt service is quite palatable if it drives franchise value up I'm right. I'm, I, you could you could just take your own life at some point, right? In the middle of this. So I'm just confirming you don't understand this either. I think he's making it up. Right, so that would be my question. Yeah. If you're listening to this and you are someone who knows what's he's going on, he's stringing together big words. It's because I, I I spend a lot of time with Mitch. I play a lot of golf with him. I consider him a very smart guy. I lean on him for mm-hmm. advice. He has you faked out. That's my question. Yes. That, did he just make all of that up, knowing I wouldn't understand? Does he it? handle people's money because he has them faked out too. He he, yeah, he handles yeah a okay. lot more money. All than, right. Yeah, he does. I question him. Okay, I, I'd like to get some some. I, yeah. I need some clarity yeah. on that as well. Eddie, you know, he should have known. To speak in layman's terms. Correct. But he didn't. Right. And, and you know what? He didn't for a reason. Mm-hmm. He tried to sound really smart, and he tried to make us look dumb. Which I agree. You don't have to try with us. But, oh, what's his name? Mitch? Mitch. Oh, Mitch had to use the big word. <laughs> I'm big word Mitch. <laughs> Listen to me explain value and accrued and money here goes there, and I take from here and break that piggy bank. I'm Mitch. <laughs> 
I'm the smartest man alive. <laughs> Listen to me use my words. He used that's the, Mitch. He used the words equity and accrue. Yeah. And at that point he lost us both. <laughs> well he did. I, I was picturing guys on the you know river, you know, you know, rowing. Yes, yeah, not you just know? crew. Yeah. <laughs> but this is a crew, so well, you're uh, right. A crew. You gotta get to the bottom. That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah, and we have a crew, a crew here. It's it's exactly basically right. the Bickler and Hembo. Yeah, I'm sure right. they didn't understand what Mitch was trying to say with his Big words. They didn't understand the word Mitch. Yeah. I mean, you know, what, what, I, they, we lost them at Mitch. Uh, see, we're much more, we're much better suited for tweets like this one. Chad tweets, did Golik just stir his coffee with his pen, then lick off the pen? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. There's actually another one asking that question from Brian. Explain that in your big words, Mitch. So did you accrue some germs and bacteria from the completely disgusting move of taking that pen, which God knows where it's been? It's been on this table and in my hand or in my bag. But I mean, it's, it's been okay. all it's, over the it's place. It's been three places. Yeah. Three places. Right. In my hand, on the, 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 the table. Or in the bag. Okay. That's the three places it's been. And in and, 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 and those places, it can have accrued an enormous amount of germs, otherwise known in some context as equity, and now you've put that into your mouth. So there's been well, an accrual of bacteria equity thing. that you are now subsidizing. This is hot coffee. So when I put the pen with germs on it into the hot coffee, what happens? Well, no, it, it's not the boiling germs are coffee. Dying. The, okay. the, the coffee is not 212 degrees. Do you know it's not? Do you know I haven't scalded the inside of my mouth right now? <laughs> you seem to have maintained the ability to I'm speak. I'm in unbelievable pain right now. <laughs> I was in pain just reading I'm the in email. Pain physically and mentally from Mitch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so my friend Mitch has now ruined our day. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. You can test drive Snapshot to see how much you could save before switching to Progressive. Visit Progressive.com slash Snapshot. Tell, tell Mitch to lose a number. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's move on. I wanted to play you um, something that um, D'Angelo Williams said mm, yes. on Shefty's podcast. Right. Shefty has a new, a relatively new still podcast called Know Them From Adam, and it's really good. He, he does really good in-depth interviews with football people, players yes, and yes, coaches and others. And, and he, has, he has so much equity and respect. Not, I didn't mean to use that word again that yeah. way. No, I know. Uh, he has accrued so much equity within the football world that the, the, those guys tend to really open up with him. And right. they're, they're very good conversations. So there's one soundbite in particular from D'Angelo Williams that I know really caught your attention, mm -hmm. Mike, and, and I think it did many. So let's share that here. This is uh, D'Angelo Williams, currently not with an NFL team, no. wants to come back and play another year. He's been productive for Pittsburgh the mm -hmm. last few years, especially when Le'Veon Bell has gone down with injury. And, and here he's talking about players that test positive and what happens when they test positive and get suspended. Correct. This one is about the drug program and right. policy in the NFL. The rules are so outdated. This, this is the issue that I have with the NFL. We preach family, 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 family. And as soon as something happens, we're individual. We are individual. And this is, what, this is the cherry on top that really bothers the hell out of me. And fans should really understand this. This is what drives me. So if a guy gets busted for pot or street drugs or something like that, they suspend him for four games. He can't come around the guys that's going to keep him from the pot. They put him in they they going to put him right back in there with the guys that he got busted with. They isolate him from uh. the, the positive vibes and influence that he going to have the locker room that's going to keep him off of the stuff. They going to put him back in the vicinity in the area and in the place where he got busted at. So the guys that you are trying to keep him away from, you push him back to them because that's who he's going to fall back on. So I, I heard that, and listen, as a former player, a lot of times, you know, I, I want to side with players, but also in the position I'm in, I have to look at everything, the big picture. And, and here's what somewhat irked me about that, and D'Angelo explaining that, and I get what he's saying, because that when you are suspended, you're not allowed at the facility, then they did make the exception for a Josh Gordon uh, from the Cleveland Browns to let him to, to be at the, at the facility. But what I'm getting a little tired of, I'm not going to lie, is the lack of accepting responsibility for what you're doing. You can sit there and say the rules are outdated. Listen, do I think at the end of the day marijuana is, and this, this is basically what we're talking about, let's be honest, from the recreational drug side, players like to smoke. They do. Now, if we're finding out that the oils are good for pain and, and that all works out to where we can use that instead of opioids, I am absolutely, positively 
all for that. But it also is giving a lot of players saying, oh, yeah, that's why I smoke. I smoke because so I'm not in pain. Bull, you like to smoke. And you're like, and do I think at the end of the day marijuana is going to be legalized everywhere? Yes, I do. And I'm fine with that. I'll be fine with it if they don't test for it anymore. I'll be fine with it when they legalize it everywhere. But right now, it's against the rules. And D'Angelo talking about you're pushing the guys back out to where they got it. Do you realize for recreational drugs, you have to have multiple offenses before you're suspended, which means offense, offense, offense. You're still in that locker room. You're still around all the guys who are supposed to be the ones saving you, yet you're getting you're testing positive over and over while you're in that environment. Rarely are guys smoking alone on a team. Players smoke. That's the reality of this. So to now sit there and rip the system, and he went on to say there should be counseling and stuff. There is. There is counseling available through the NFL. There is counseling available through the NFL PA. Through the players, so it's there, and then all everything else I keep hearing is, well, marijuana is not addictive. Well, if it's not addictive, do you need counseling for? I don't know all that, but I'm hearing one thing on one side and one thing on another side. What I would like to stress, and I would, would like to hear first, and and is accept the responsibility. You are not allowed to smoke marijuana in the NFL. Someday, maybe you will. You're the one ingesting it and breaking the rule multiple times before you get suspended. So to sit there and worry about that part of it and think, oh, my God, he's now can't be around the guys. He's going to do nothing but hang out with his druggies. Let's let's first get to the real issue. That to me is like watching a movie and doing something illegal and blaming the movie. Look in the mirror. That's where this needs to start. How about D'Angelo saying, you know what, players, you shouldn't be doing this. I don't agree with the rule, but it's the rule right now. Don't smoke. It is illegal. Or if you have never been in the program, you can do it all you want around the year except for the one time that you get tested between like April and June or August, whatever it is, in that area. You can smoke all you want, and you won't get busted for it. But that, I guess that's my point of this. We always want to blame somebody else. Why are we isolating the guy? Why isn't there help? Well, you're isolating a guy who's done it two or three times. And there is help available, and it's your fault. You put it in your body in the first place. I just get a little tired at times. And, and listen, if they want to change the rule and say you're suspended, but now you can be at the facility, I'm cool with that too. I, I absolutely am. I'm not saying don't change that. My point is we do way too much, and I'm not just talking about this just made me think more and more about other things of I confess he did it or I want to blame somebody else for an action that I'm responsible for. I'm responsible. I know when I'm smoking, it's not legal in my sport. So when I get busted, you know what? It's your own damn fault for it. So don't start yelling at everybody else for what they're not doing for you because you got busted two or three times before you got suspended. That's my point. And I'll reiterate just so it's out there. I'll be fine when it's legalized. I'll be fine if they don't test for it anymore. That's cool. I'm all that that's absolutely fine by me. And I'm really fine if we if we figure out in the in the oil form or whatever. I had a great conversation at the Gridiron Greats with Kyle Turley, who is, is really working toward this. If it can work as pain deterrent over opioids, I'm so all for it. So don't get me wrong, I am all for that. But right now, be responsible for what you're putting in your body and stop complaining about what's done after you time and time and time again have decided and knowingly done something that you shouldn't do. Okay, that's very well said, and there's a, there's a lot there in all the things you said. I think I agree with the overwhelming majority of everything that you just said. Um, and I, I, would, I, would, I, would, uh, I would compare this to my stance on a lot of the NCAA rules, which I disagree with, right? but I do not, I right. cannot sit here and say, I disagree with this rule, so my advice to you is to, to break, break it. it. Right, right. My advice to you is to try and change it. And I hope they do. Again, I hope they do in the NFL. I really do. I strongly believe that they should stop testing for marijuana right now and 
and, and more to the point that they should remove it as a banned substance. But if they don't want to for right. the purposes of, of that optic, if, if they think that's a bad optic, then they should just stop testing for it, and we don't have a problem in the first place. It's sort of like when Major League Baseball, all through the quote-unquote steroid era, when people say it wasn't against the rules of the sport, it actually was. There was a rule against yes. using steroids, but there was no testing for it. So unless you would just walk in and said, hey— I'm using steroids. You weren't going to get that, caught, and which is exactly where I was. Right in, in '87 when I used steroids, it was on. It was illegal to do, but it wasn't tested for. But so it was still, which is, which is, right. for all intents and purposes, not against the rules. Right. Um, but except it is. You can you can look people in the eye and say, well, it's against our rules, and you could do the same thing with marijuana if you chose to here. And that's what I personally think they should do. That said, you're right. I can't sit here and advocate breaking a rule because you don't like it. And we had this conversation with Roger Goodell, and we've had it with others, that right now they're not at a place where they're comfortable going there yet. Okay, that's their decision to make. Ultimately, it isn't mine. You know where I stand yeah. on it. The one thing I will say is that if you have a player who, has re- who, who, who to your point, has tested repeatedly yeah. for this stuff, one way of looking that, at that, because most of us who don't have a problem with drugs or alcohol, let's put them in one hat, mm-hmm. although they're very different, of course, who don't have a problem with substance abuse, look at that and say, well, that's just a guy making bad decision after bad decision after bad decision. Right. And at some point you have to draw the line. I get it. Right. There is another way of looking at that. It's saying that. If you are forfeiting an opportunity to make all of this money and have all of the opportunity that comes to a pro football player because you are continuously using these drugs, that is pretty decent evidence that that is a person who has a significant problem, right? Like, this is probably not totally voluntary. I'm not an expert in the area of drug addiction. See, I'm not either. I don't want to talk about it in depth. And I know some are addictive and... Everybody keeps telling me marijuana is not. Now, right. I, I, I don't know that, you know, as far as physically addicted as, as opposed to psychologically, psychologically addicted. I, got, right. I have it. I don't I know. don't want to even get into that because we're going to get into an area that you should right. have people right. who are more expert in this talking about I, it than we are. I agree. But what I think is not hard to do is look at that just from the outside as an observer and say, here's a guy. Take Martavis Bryant, for example, mm-hmm. or anyone who was rep- or Josh Gordon. Is a perfect example. Josh Gordon, we had his college coach in here. Who was his college coach? Was it oh, Dino Babers? Uh, I, yes, I think it yes, was. It was, yeah. And, and he said, like, Josh Gordon used to babysit his kids right. when he was his wide receivers coach in, uh, coach in college. That he's a great guy. Uh, again, I, I don't know Josh Gordon at all, so I'll just take his word for it. But my point is, maybe Josh Gordon isn't a bad guy. Maybe he's not a person making repeated bad decisions, which, which clearly he is. But maybe he's a person with a legitimate problem. And if he is a person who is, has a legitimate problem, are you better off trying to address that by keeping him inside or by, by casting him outside? That's the one piece of it right, I, that, I, I would, that I would wonder aloud if you aren't actually doing more harm than good by saying, okay, this is your fourth chance. Now we're casting you away. I understand the thinking behind it. My gut feeling is that it is probably I, not the right way to address I'm it. I'm not the one to answer that. And as I said, if, if everybody feels the best thing for somebody is to have them around the facility, I, I'm all for that. Again, I, I'm not... What D'Angelo Williams said, I'm, I'm not disputing that if you want to have a guy there. Like I said, if you feel that's what's best, then so be it. I'm just, I'm just a little tired of the let's blame everybody else for not you know, dealing with something that was your own fault. And as I said, there is help. It is available. At some point, Greeny, and I get what you're saying, don't you have to become responsible? Don't you have to be an adult? Don't you have to be a professional and say, you know what, I, I – and again, I'm not down this road to know maybe people don't think they have a problem, but there is help from the NFL and the NFLPA, the Players Association. It's there. You have friends on that team. Is there a responsibility of a friend helping a friend, the family helping the player get the help? This is what I, I don't know all the ins and outs of that because I've never been in that, but I do agree. If you can do a study, if you can do a look, if you can talk to professionals at this, because let's remember, the NFL, Major League Baseball, hockey, the NBA, they're not professionals in dealing with drug addiction, domestic violence, and all these things we talk about. They need to talk to professionals about that to find the best plans. And if you talk to professionals and they say, listen, the best thing is for this guy to stay in this group and have the, the people around him, 
I am absolutely all for that. But I just don't like how we start out pointing out all the bad things that everybody else is doing when the whole crux of the problem is you not being able to not smoke a, mar- smoke a joint. I mean, that, that, you know, that, that's the crux of this thing. And it's marijuana we're talking mostly about. And, oh, by the way, they've already lessened everything for marijuana, so it even takes more busts for you to do that to get suspended. So at some point, where's the responsibility on you to take care of this situation? The, the, of course it is. But, but let's not forget, what's the only responsibility you have in your life and we all have in our lives greater than our profession? That is our families, right? right? How many people in America and across the world have had their families destroyed, yes. torn yes. apart by drug addiction, by alcohol addiction, by other problems like that? This is not unique to pro football. No, no, it absolutely is How many people do you not. maybe even know in your own life who've had their marriages break up because of problems with alcohol, mm-hmm. who've had, you know, who, who don't take care of their kids, whatever the case may be, this is not unique to that. So you can say, well, where's the responsibility there? Well, it's, it's a problem. It I mean, is a problem. People have an addiction I, and they have a problem and they, they don't do it because they say, you know, I'm going to prioritize doing this over my responsibility yeah, I'm going to, to ruin my, my job. I'm going to ruin my life. Right. It's not something they're doing willingly. But I think we should end it on that note, which is to say, neither you or I know what the right answer is no, here. No, no, I don't have a problem with D'Angelo Williams saying that in his opinion, he doesn't think that's the right way to do it. Uh, but to your point, that the responsibility does begin, and, and, and somewhere the NFL's responsibility to solve this problem for an individual comes to an end. Well, let, let me ask it's you that. It's not their problem. If you had a drug problem, yeah. is it ESPN's responsibility to get you help? No, it's not. It's not. Because, but, but, you know, I'm not the kind of if asset to somebody them. in place, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, it, they it have that. It they doesn't have matter drug if counseling. the 53rd guy on the roster gets busted or the top player. Well, we know that it does. Well, no, as far as help yeah. is concerned, is my point. The help that's out there through the PA or through the NFL. So whether it's you or or whatever a lower position is here at ESPN, is how much how far is it ESPN's responsibility outside of offering help? Here's help for you if you want it. You know, if they suspend you, can you not come to the facility? I don't. I don't know all that, but where. Where does that end? Are they responsible for getting you right? There's, there's two answers to that question. One of them is, what do I think morally? The other is legally. The, the answer to legally is, I have no idea. I don't actually have any right. idea. I do know, because, I mean, if you look at our... Um, you know, our, our, our health insurance packet, I right, mean, you right. see that we have options for counseling oh, and all that yes, kind of stuff, yes, which yes. Um, I don't know exactly how that works. So morally, I think, you know, as an employer, you have some obligation and then it ends. You right, know, I mean, right. but but where the, does it end? The I don't sun know. is the, yeah. the Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, so it's not an easy topic, but I appreciate your passion on it, and I think everybody does. I think just to end this on a light note, this whole situation, we should ask Mitch what he thinks <laughs> well, and what big words he would use to answer this. I'll tell you this. Whatever it is, he would. whatever the problem is, he'd throw money at it. Mike and Mike, <laughs> presented by Progressive Insurance, guests on the Shell Pinto Performance Line. We'll see what Ryan Rossillo thinks of this. We'll We'll see what Dominique Foxworth knows about this. Right, right. He actually becomes an excellent guest. Not that he wasn't already going to be, but he's joining us in 40 minutes, and he's got the inside from the Players Association on this issue and more. Home isn't just a place. It's a feeling. Whether you're at home, your business, or online, ADT helps keep you safe. With security systems, home automation, alarms, and surveillance so you can feel at home wherever you are. Go to ADT.com to get that feeling. ADT, home, safe, home. Hey, everyone, Mike Golick here. Support for Mike and Mike podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. With Rocket Mortgage, you can apply simply and understand fully so you can mortgage confidently. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, nmlsconsumeraccess.org number 3030. There's an enormous amount of Mitch response in our Twitter here. Uh, there's a hashtag, Big Words Mitch. And I just want to tell you, so my friend Mitch, after he sent me that email, I wrote him back, did you hear the conversation that ensued? And he wrote me back, no, I'm on the train. And I just wrote him, 
I have a feeling you're oh, going to hear about it. Oh, he is, yeah. So let's see how his day goes. Anyway, Ryan Rosillo has made his way in our studio here. How are you, Ryan? I'm good, guys. How are you? Good. good. We are well, and you look very nice. Yes, you, are you do. Be suited. Um, I feel great. Right. We just had a very interesting conversation that stemmed from D'Angelo Williams' comments on Shefty's podcast about the NFL and the way that if a player tests positive for street drugs enough times, they ultimately sort of cast him away. And D'Angelo Williams, to, 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 for his suspension, he can't be around the facility. And D'Angelo Williams has a problem with that. And Mike, in, in, in very passionate terms, you know, described the idea that when does this become about personal responsibility and stop being the team or the NFL's job to take care of someone if that person isn't able to take care of themselves, which brings up the whole issue of dependency and, and, and addiction and all of that. So I know I've put a lot on the table for you here without the context, but just from a general sense, what do you make of that? D'Angelo Williams basically suggesting that the NFL preaches family and then casts people aside. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't really agree with him on actually anything. Uh, I've heard him talk about this before, and I know the Steelers have had teammates where they go, you know, just keep sending me away. Like, when you get popped for, for weed, you screw up in the NFL. It's basically set up for you to get tested in this window, and then you're supposed to know it and figure it out. So, you know, because they run football as family ads, which were clearly a response for a PR thing, you know, during, all of a sudden it's like, hey, watch football, have sex, you'll have a baby this summer. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's basically what the ad was. Uh, it, it doesn't also mean that you're supposed to treat it as if every player on a roster, all 1,500 plus, are somebody's son. I, I think any place that you work at is sympathetic. Uh, you would think most places are sympathetic to a degree and then after a while it's like what are we supposed to do what are we supposed to do so if you get popped five times and it is a dependency thing which we become more sympathetic about like we're just supposed to keep letting you be around the team like i just i can't imagine getting to the point where it's like you're gonna lose all of this stuff if you can't stop smoking weed and you know i've i've had friends that that when i work construction i've had friends in college and it's like a daily routine yeah and it's like i cannot believe like this is your deal and then you know eventually you turn like 30 or you turn in late 20s and you go i got to figure this thing out and they don't have anything on the line you know i was working construction with these guys and i don't i i mean i don't really get his point and this is after he had said on Schefter's thing where every player should be a max player in the NFL on contracts these NFL players don't seem to understand the NBA economics as apparently like 53 being greater than 15 players on a roster like they can't seem to understand that so I uh, I disagree with him on this. I mean the players NFL players I'm sorry their math of the, you have a four times as big as the uh, even though you make twice as much money you have four times as big as roster the math doesn't work for the numbers that they want and, and let me put some numbers to it Greeny for actual marijuana violations to get a one-year banishment you would have to violate the marijuana policy six times first violation no discipline players referred to the substance abuse program second violation two game fine third violation four game fine fourth violation four game suspension fifth violation 10 game suspension sixth violation one year banishment and let me add this for the marijuana and for the recreational drugs you only can't go to the facility if you're banished for a year. If it's a four-game or a ten-game, you can go to the facility. It's only for the year. So six times before it costs you a year. I mean, and again, the NFL and the PA offers help uh, for players who need it. So at, at some point, man. Right, I, like I'm okay, I'm okay with, with some of it. Like, hey, let's figure this out. Let's get this yeah. worked out. But then, then what is – like somehow we've become so sympathetic to everything now – that it's like any kind of punishment is uncool. Like I don't, I don't like. I'm usually a pretty like. I don't care what guys do. I really don't. Uh, I, me I'm, too. Like, I'm not some moralist. I've never been a moralist on the air, but I've heard this argument before, and it's just like so. Basically, you just want a player to be able to do whatever he wants and then still have the same benefits. But, well, that's. I mean, eventually, like the world doesn't work that way. No, not not with anything. And 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 as I said, at some point, I do think marijuana will be legal everywhere. Fine. It won't be tested for anymore. I'm fine with that. And, and the most important thing to me, if we do figure out that it can be better for pain in a, in, in a form than opioids, that's number one uh, for me if, if we get there and, and everybody buys into it. But this, I, I, I just, I'm sorry. That at some point, you just got to say, man, it's stop the smoking. It's, it's 
on you, and you get so many chances uh, before anything really bad happens to you. All right, Ryan Rosillo is here. You'd hear him uh, every afternoon here on ESPN Radio Coast to Coast. He's got the Straight Talk brought to you by Straight Talk Wireless. Best phones, best networks, no contracts. I want to read a tweet from Ryan Rosillo yesterday, which I think is interesting and which I sort of alluded to earlier this morning. Not the tweet, but a similar thought. Right. And you mocked me. He tweets, with the way Tatum is playing, should the Celtics trade Gordon Hayward? <sighs> And so that is a no, variation. Kidding, right? Of course you were right, kidding. Okay. But it is a variation on my thought yeah. that the addition of Gordon Hayward, which is an A-minus NBA player, and Jason Tatum, who was, it was a one-and-done, who was not coming onto a terrible team where he's asked to be the answer, as they usually are, but is coming into a place where he's going to have one role and one role only, and that is find us 15 points a night, which I think he's capable of doing as a rookie. Depending on what they have to give up now from a salary cap standpoint, in your mind, and you know the Celtics as well as anybody does, to what degree have they closed the gap on Cleveland in the Eastern Conference? The gap isn't closed. It's just Cleveland, you got to remember last year, they didn't care about seeding at all. I mean, they may, they may look at the East this year other than Boston, and, and you hope Washington would be a little tougher coming into the season after what happened in the playoffs, but they might feel like they could be the, the fourth or fifth seed and roll into the NBA Finals. So I don't think that the gap is closed, but what the Celtics needed desperately was a second really good scorer who could, and I call him shot clock scorer. Shot clock goes down, six seconds less. you got the ball. Can you figure out a way to get us a good look? And Gordon Hayward can do that. And Isaiah Thomas is really the only guy that you could depend on. So when you watched what the Wizards did, even though inconsistently in the playoffs, and then when he was actually playing against Cleveland before he was out with that hip injury, you could sell out defensively against Isaiah Thomas and hope somebody else burns you. And Avery Bradley have moments, and Al Horford right, have some right. really good stretches, and they have other stretches. But that's where what you're looking great. for from right. those guys is to have those stretches. And yeah. You count on Isaiah Thomas. You have now are going to count on Gordon Hayward, right? Yeah, I mean, exactly. That's... Right. And I mean, he's he's probably better defensively than uh, that he gets some credit for. You know, he's a guy that has done a great job, especially two of the last three seasons, the way he shot the basketball. So you're trying to find of the seven or eight guys that you play, like how can we maximize out that talent? Because Jay Crowder's a pretty good player, and he's an incredible contract for the next three years at about $7 million plus. And then you look at how good Tatum, I think, will be. And, you know, they like Jalen Brown a lot after last season. I think it's one of those things where you go, okay, yeah, we like some of these other pieces, but this is one of our five guys that's in that top 20 range that we can have out there all the time. So it's an improvement, but they still probably would like to add even more shooting and more specifically somebody around the rim that can not have Horford playing center the entire time because they were one of the worst rebounding teams of the playoff teams in the NBA last year. You were in a suit, which suggests to me you're doing Sports Center. Can I keep you a few more minutes or do you have to run? Yeah, let's talk LeBron. Okay. <laughs> okay. Oh, I didn't know if you were being serious. Or a kidding. story you will not believe. About LeBron James? Yes. Okay. Coming up next. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this. I know this. I know this. Um... Five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. They'll allow it. Congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. You uh, have the much more provocative tease. You said a story about LeBron. I won't believe. What do you have? Okay, so when I talk to teams, this is really before the draft and you know throughout free agency, we just all love gossiping. We love it, right? We love it. Hey, did you hear about this? What's going on here? And it always, with a lot of teams, we come back, we're like, what do you think happens with LeBron? And everyone, it feels like, around the league and the way we've talked about it publicly in the media side of things, we've already packed his bags in 2018. And you know what? He may leave. I'm not here to tell you that he's absolutely staying in Cleveland. But what I'd ask you is, at this stage of his career, turning 33 later this year, he's still the best player in the league. This is still about rings. So in what situation, and I understand how much things can change, in what situation is he going to be better off in 2018, a year from now, What's better that would be better than Cleveland, even though I know Boston is, is getting closer. We know there's some other teams that could get better. But on paper in 2018, what destination is going to be a better lock of getting to the NBA Finals than staying with Cleveland, a Cleveland team that likely can still figure out a way to add an asset or two with an older player or something that they decide to do through the trade deadline? So I think everyone around the league has already loaded up the moving trucks here for LeBron, and I don't think he even knows what he's doing next summer, and yet it's being talked about as if it's a certainty. I. What have I been saying? Well, you've been saying basically exactly, exactly that. Exactly the same thing. So here, here's what I would suggest to you. 
The last thing you said is the one I agree with the most, which is I don't think that he knows what he's doing to the extent that what happens this year will inform that, right? If they win the championship or something like that, he probably doesn't leave. Any number of things could happen. If things go really sideways this year, whatever. If he wins, by the way, and it was brought up to me just to jump in, like who would win a title and then leave their hometown? Like, I don't think that makes it easier. Be very unlikely. But they probably won't win the title this year because Golden State is going to be, barring injury, head and shoulders better than everybody. So let me just let me just give you five guys that I could see playing together on the Lakers in the fall of 2018, and I think they could make the money work if they, if they figured out how to do it. LeBron James, Paul George, Chris Paul, Dwayne Wade, and Carmelo Anthony. Okay, you'd be at least $90 million with – the first three guys. Not necessarily. Um, they can do what Kevin Durant did if they want to. If yeah. they, first of all, Dwayne Wade and Carmelo Anthony are, will, will be free agents. They can sign for whatever they want. You know what? No one is paying them $20 million a year anymore. You got can Chris I just Paul, say no? You think no yeah. chance? No, I just, I mean, you just put like a bunch of guys on a team. No, they're not just a bunch of guys. They're four best friends and Paul George, who <laughs> considers LeBron his, right. his, his, uh, his what's the word? Three his in their mid 30s. Yeah, but I mean, but at this point, Wade and Mello become role players. They get the chance to play together, which they've always wanted to do. Chris Paul has his best shot ever to win. LeBron wants to go to L.A. Magic sends, sells him on all this, and Paul George is the wing defender that you need to have a Match fighting chance. Match up those four against the four in Golden State. It's five. I gave you five. There's five. I, but Match I, up I, those I just, five against the four in if, Golden even State. Even if I would concede to you that that beats Golden State, I think it's a real reach. To sit here today and go, yeah, you know what? All of these moving pieces will all align perfectly, and these guys will all just join up there. That I mean, said, I think if we were having the conversation a year before 2010, and I, when all the conversation was about where are the superstars going to go, who's going to get LeBron, who's going to get Dwayne Wade, who's going to get Chris Bosh, who's going to get this one, if I had said to you, they're all going to wind up together in Miami and take less money, each of them, to do it, we might have, some people would right, have but said Greeny, that's you just, you just put five all-stars on a team, yeah. and none of them are on that team right now. Um, that's true. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. But that's the place they want to go. And How do you know? Because everyone How do you thinks know? Because, because everyone at the says end of the day so. wants to I mean, be a again, Laker. Again, just what Ryan said, and I've been screaming. How do you know? All of a sudden, this but is that, where that's, everybody that's wants the to thing. be. Like I heard Zach Lowe with you guys yesterday. I thought he was great, and he's like, "Look, this is a guess, but the guess is that he's out." And then it's like, "No, he has an entertainment thing." Okay, well, so so what does that mean? Like, he has a production company, so he has to move to L.A.? I, he has to do Alonzo Ball next you know, year? And, and before you said, well, you know, Magic will get a meeting with him telling him how he could talk to any Hollywood you know, producer. He could do that now. Anything he wants to do, he can do right now. He's already Ryan, making TV. Ryan, shows. I'm with you. To sit there and say he's going to go to L.A. because part of it is he wants to be in Hollywood, to me, is ridiculous. LeBron James is about rings right now. His best chance to win a ring is in Cleveland to get to the finals for the next three years to at least have a shot at a ring instead of trying to manufacture a team that you hope will come together and beat Golden State. I, I, How I, mad are you right now, Green? I'm not mad at all. I'm going to wind up looking like a genius on this thing. <laughs> I, I, I believe that LeBron, that Paul George wants to play with LeBron James. I that agree I with believe. you. No, that's, that's true. I, I agree with that. I believe that if, if LeBron James had told Paul George, I'm going to stay in Cleveland long term, one way or another, Paul George would have wound up on Cleveland this summer. That he would have found a way to work it out so that he would have, that they would have gotten him to, I mean, instead of getting Sabonis and Oladipo, okay, they maybe, would have worked out some way to make that happen. There's some real thought that, like, Pritchard was going out of his way to get back at, at Team Paul George. We're going, all right, so you do this, and now your values decrease this no, much. If so, that's a fireable offense uh, to me. I mean, you, you, you know You're going to make the best trade, right. But, okay, but, You've got to make the best right, deal for your but team. What's the other trade that was so much better than this? They didn't want Kevin Love. Well, like, I don't all, know. Like, I mean, we, I, we've, we put Gary Harrison in the Hall of Fame. I have no earthly idea what the trade was that was better than this because I have no idea what conversations they were having. But it, it was striking to me how little they got. It seems impossible to me that if LeBron James wanted to orchestrate Paul George coming to Cleveland, he couldn't have figured out some way uh, to make that yeah, happen. I don't know. I think, I think you're reaching there because I've talked to so many people on this thing. They wanted him there. They wanted him there for so long. And... This was not a, a LeBron. Like, think of all the LeBron mistakes we've already made this week. Like, we all thought because Billups didn't take the gig that he had to have had a conversation with LeBron about it. And that's LeBron going, Chauncey, don't take this. Then I still find don't out Chauncey- fully believe that he didn't. I never will, even though everyone says it, whatever. I can Okay, but I'm just going to sit here and tell you. Like, that you won't believe it, but everyone says that they're all getting together in Lake Lakers, you believe that. The Cavs side I'm of the thing, it, so LeBron's no side of the it, thing, all said that that Chauncey-LeBron conversation didn't happen, and then Chauncey tells us it didn't happen.
Right. And, but you're you're right. Correct. That's exactly <laughs> right. Like most geniuses, I won't be fully appreciated until after years, my time. Ryan. Listen, listen to me for one years. quick second. No, I love it. I love LeBron it. James. Chris, uh, uh, LeBron James, Chris Paul, Carmelo Anthony, and Dwayne Wade will all be free to do whatever they want at the end of next season. I don't think that's a coincidence. No, I think you want the banana boat thing to happen. I think we Boy, all kind of want it do. to happen, I, but it's not going to happen. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. The City Double Cash Card presents tips for watching sports with your friends. Number five, be passionate. Oh, shouting what I would have done on that last play. I am way too invested in this. Check it out. I'm completely overreacting, so you know I care. Wouldn't it be great if everyone said what they meant? The City Double Cash Card does. It lets you earn double cash back with 1% when you buy and 1% as you pay. The City Double Cash Card. Double means double. A couple of different things in here. I'm telling you right now, I'm going to be... The one who got this no, one you're right not. on LeBron. No, I am. You're not. I'm going to get this you, one right. It's just amazing how you believe what some people play and don't believe what others. You're, you're so selective in your believing of what people say. Yes, I have selective belief. Yes, you do. I have, I have selective uh, belief. You do. You do. Um, and, and a lot of different things. We're going to have Dominic Foxworth in here in a second, and he will get into a lot of the topics. We stumbled onto one here that I think he'll be perfect for, the issue of the NFL – um, and where its responsibility as an employer, and it's really a larger societal question, um, which I, I don't fully know the answer to from a legal standpoint, but where does its responsibility as an employer end when one of its employees right. has issues of substance abuse? Let's, let's just call it that to sort of use a catch-all right. term. Right. Um, you know, because you asked me, well, if I have a drug problem, where is ESPN's responsibility to help me? And my honest answer to that question is I have no idea. I, I, I don't, I don't either. actually know. I don't either. I, I know they would have programs for help just like the NFLPA does, and Dominic Foxworth would be great to ask about that. But it, it, it turns to be an interesting situation, but just the way it was first phrased with D'Angelo uh, Williams in, in the podcast by Shefty, I just, I just thought to expand the, the conversation a bit. Well, let's do it. We've got Dominic ready to go. He's on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. Get instant gold status at Shell. Join the Fuel Rewards program now at fuelrewards.com slash gold. You hear him on the morning roast and frequently with Dan Levitard and company and all sorts of other places. Our friend Dominic Foxworth is back with us. Good morning, Dominic. Morning, guys. Well, we had a bunch of stuff planned for you, and then this D'Angelo Williams comment really got <laughs> Golic going, and, and you're the perfect person to get perspective from. So let me set it all up for you and for everyone who may not have heard it. This was D'Angelo Williams' longtime NFL running back on Adam Schefter's podcast this week talking about um, a, a one particular piece of the NFL's drug program. The rules are so outdated. This, this is the issue that I have with the NFL. We preach family, 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 family. And as soon as something happens, we're individual. We are individual. And this is what this is the cherry on top that really bothers the hell out of me. And fans should really understand this. This is what drives me. So if a guy get busted for pot or street drugs or something like that, they suspend him for four games, he can't come around the guys that's gonna keep him from the pot, they put him in. They they gonna put him right back in there with the guys that he got busted with. They isolate him uh, from the, the positive vibes and influence that he gonna have the locker room. That's gonna keep him off of the stuff. They gonna put him back in the vicinity, in the area, and in, in the place where he got busted at. So the guys that you trying to keep him away from, you push him back to them because that's who he's gonna fall back on. So that was D'Angelo Williams. Uh, Mike, before we give the floor to Dominic, yeah. give, a, if, if well, it's possible, a 30-second version of yeah, what your response I, I mean, on some of those things, he's just wrong. I mean, he's, he says the, the first time, you know, you, you get busted for that, you're, you're on your own. You're not. I mean, for marijuana, it takes six violations to be suspended for a year. And also, that's the only time you're banished from the facility. 
The fifth time when you're banished, when you're suspended for ten games, you're not banished. The fourth violation, where you're uh, four game suspension, you're not banished. The third time, you're fine. The second time, you're fine. I mean, come on. I mean, th- th- so my point is. is Real quickly on this, Dominic, if they legalize marijuana everywhere, I'm fine with that. If we determine that that however it's used as a pain medicine over opioids is better for us, I'm fine with that. I am absolutely fine with that. It just sounds too much in that in that uh, comment by D'Angelo that we're blaming others for something you have to be nailed for six times before you're suspended for a year. Where's the personal responsibility? It's illegal to do. If you want to do it, it's your choice, but consequences come of it until the rule changes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's hard to disagree with you there, but I think we don't want to get caught in the, in the um, kind of the weeds of discussing exactly how many um, violations it takes to get suspended. I think the, the general point of what he's saying, I think, is, is fairly accurate in that the NFL does talk a lot about family, and it, not even just the commercials, but like in the locker rooms. But somebody like D'Angelo and, and veteran players know that <laughs> that family stuff is, is not accurate, and they are out for... Uh, not that they don't care about the players, but profit is their most important motive. And if you are no longer serve any purpose to them, then you have to go. I think that where I struggle with this is people want to draw a hard line between where it becomes the league's responsibility and where it becomes the player's responsibility. But I think those things over, overlap. I think the league has this um, has a unique population, and that unique population, I think – it becomes somewhat their responsibility also, not to take any onus off of the players, but it does also become their responsibility. You can't have uh, cultivate or encourage these guys to cultivate this kind of myopic view of the world where there's nothing more important than football, and then if they've made too many mistakes, then you cut them off and send them out into the wilderness without uh, any resources. I think that is a fair criticism of the league in in any company, frankly. Should should it be a fair criticism? You, You just said the league says it's family. What do we talk about in the locker room as players, Dominique, that we're family, that we're brothers in arms, that we're family as well? So now after the second violation, you've been fined two games and people kind of know what the deal is. Where's the help from the brothers within that that doesn't lead to the third violation, the fourth violation, the fifth violation, the sixth violation, and now they're suspended for a year? We want to point our finger at the NFL, which they offer programs, and the NFLPA as well offers programs. I guess my point is I, I just get a little tired of blaming others for something that you're doing, and if you want to throw the family thing around, that's the one thing we always talk about in the locker room. We stick together. Then where's the help right. for that player before? Before he gets the third, fourth, fifth, and sixth violation from his family in the locker room. Yeah, so I agree with you, and I think I, at no point am I absolving the players of their personal responsibility, but I do think that it's also uh, a responsibility of the team and the league, the team and the league and their teammates. I don't think that pushing guys out is the solution. And I think I, I heard uh, you guys on with Ryan earlier, and I have the complete opposite reaction to than you. Golick and Ryan, when you hear about a guy uh, failing like the easy to pass drug test and then failing it again, my reaction isn't so uh, this guy can't control it or this guy is making poor decisions. My reaction is is that he doesn't want to be suspended. So what is it about this situation that is too big for him and how can we help him? And just having programs. And I mean, my experience at the NFLPA and my respect for the league, I I say this as respectfully as I can, is just having pro- programs is a good thing to say when something like this happens. But if the programs aren't effective, then what's the point of having programs other than just to, to roll it out there and to kind of cover your own butt and say, we did our job, we did the best we could, this guy can't be helped. But I think when you have such a unique population and a unique business that the NFL has, they do have to take on a little bit more responsibility because it's not like if a guy makes enough mistakes, he goes off and plays in the other NFL. It's not a normal job. It's not a normal situation. And, again, I try to reiterate this. I'm not saying that the player doesn't have responsibility, but I think that that um, kind of in the Venn diagram of responsibility, a lot of it overlaps where the player needs to get control and want to take control, and the league and the team and their teammates, they have some responsibility also because I do believe that, that – um, there's something about that fraternity and being in, in football, and there's nothing brotherly about putting a guy out when he's in his time of need and he has no other resources. 
What about the responsibility of the PA in their programs? I mean, we could just as easily say they're not working either. So, I mean, do those oh yeah, have- no, I, I thought, I thought, I thought I said both. I, I certainly believe that I said both, and I agree. Okay. I think that, I mean, there's a ton of things with the PA that uh, I think transition. I mean, we can go down a list of things that I, I'm not a PA apologist, though I do believe in the power of the union and the importance sure. of the union. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like they have that they have everything figured out. I'm the with you. I was a big union guy. I, I'm with you. I was a big union union guy as well. So if if it were left up to you, what would be the best way to handle this situation? Yeah, I mean, I'm not I'm not an expert, so I, I don't know how to deal with that. But I I think that whether it takes two tests or six tests or twenty tests, I don't think that you should get to a point where a guy is completely put out and maybe you don't let him play but I think he always remains your responsibility and I mean I think that's the same is true for it should be true for all players whether it's brain injury or anything else there's a lot of money being made and a, and a great deal of the sacrifices fall on the players be it their bodies or their future earning potential by completely being myopic and focusing only on this sport there's a lot of sacrifices made by the players and I think whether they make mistakes or bad choices or, or, or not I think the responsibility is to make sure that they live healthy and happy and uh, uh, long lives afterwards res- falls on the, the players in the league and the union. So, I mean, that's, that's my only point. I'm not saying that the players are without responsibility, but I think that the answer should never be, oh, you messed up too many times. All right, go figure it out on your own. I think that means that we haven't figured out the right way to help that particular player. And, I mean, that's just maybe I'm too soft. I'm a bleeding heart on this, but uh, that's how I feel about this particular population of, of individuals. Yeah, I, I would just to throw in my own thought on this is while I'm also not an expert in this area, take football completely out of the equation, take business completely out of the equation. How many people do we know, do any of us know personally yeah. whose lives, whose families, whose marriages have been seriously impacted by issues, whether they be with drugs or with alcohol or something like that? This happens regular, routinely in this country. Um, and so it is a problem that goes well beyond the sport. Whose responsibility is it? To, to me, that's, if a player is, is testing positive, at the one time of year that everyone knows he can't test positive, that is an immediate suggestion to me that he has a right, problem. Right. You know, I mean, however, Dominique, right. you want it, whatever term you want to use for it, addiction or whatever it may be, that's an immediate sign he has a problem, whether it's the first time or the sixth time, because, you know, you call it the idiot test because any idiot knows how not to fail it. So if you fail it, it doesn't make you an idiot. In, in most cases, it probably makes you a person that has a problem and one that should be addressed immediately. Whose responsibility is to do that? I don't really have the answer to that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I think I appreciate that you kind of blew it up into a bigger societal conversation because I think this is congruent with the way that I feel about society. Is just I don't think that casting people aside is the answer. Maybe the programs that we have or the solutions that we have, we haven't found the right one for every individual, but I think that's true for society, that, that individuals have personal responsibility. But, I mean, we are a, a country. We are a group of people. We have responsibility to kind of advance all of us, and if you leave anybody behind, I think that's a problem, which, uh, I mean, is obviously true for a smaller group like the NFL. All right. Mike and Mike presented by Progressive Insurance. Dominique Foxworth is with us on the Shell Pennzoil performance line. One of the things we really wanted to get into with you today is um, the, the role that a, that a union, a players association plays in individual players' contracts. So just off the top, let me add Kevin Durant took less money. You're obviously well aware of this. Took less money than he could have to re-sign in Golden State, in part to help out the owners with, with luxury tax, which will in some ways impact their ability to sign players, but also will just keep them from having to pay more luxury tax. And my immediate thought, and those of many of us who are not inside of this, would be, well, the union's not going to like that. They're not going to like the biggest stars in the sport not getting as much money as they possibly can. So with your insight into this, and I should mention, you were the president of this, of the NFLPA at one time, for the fans who don't know this. Um, what would be your perspective on that? What would you expect were the conversations the union was having? Well, there is a, a hard percentage for both the NFL and the NBA of revenue that must go to the players. If the teams don't reach that revenue, then they have to pay it to the players in a lump sum after the season, and it's uh, incumbent upon the players to, to decide how to divvy it up. So I'm not sure that the union necessarily cares who takes the money. I, I think everyone wants the guys to get as much as they want, but uh, they all know once you're in the union, you know, or once you've been in the league long enough or any league long enough, you recognize that there are more important 
important things than money. And I'm sure lots of people don't want to hear this who aren't making millions of dollars, but there are more important things than money. And I think Kevin Durant is, has shown that. And I don't think it necessarily matters or should matter to the union or to other players because the union's responsibility or their, their – um, yeah, their responsibility is to make sure that all – for the NBA, I think it's 51 percent, that all 51 yes. percent of revenue is going to players. And that's all that they care about. They don't care who gets it, how they get it. That's on the owners to figure out how that happens. So I, I don't think that the union should care about that at all. It it's probably would be a bigger deal in a sport like um, baseball where there is no – no um, salary cap, but in, in um, basketball, there is no salary cap, but they have the luxury tax, so they could potentially go over it, but I don't think that they care necessarily which players get the money as long as the players are getting their money. Okay, the, the, Largely, that is the right point. I do think what, if you sort of if you start absolving owners of having to go into a luxury tax and, and put a system in place, the, here's what the NBA owners did brilliantly in their CBA. They put a ton of things in there to protect themselves from themselves, right? Like, right. you can't go over by this much, otherwise you will start losing your ability. They're just afraid that there's three or four guys who will spend whatever they need to spend to try and win, and they don't want that to be a decisive factor in the way that Mike, it felt like it was in baseball for a long time and has ceased to be. Yeah, that's, that's exactly so, right. And, and, and to put numbers to what... what uh, um, Dominique is saying 51% of the revenue for, for a number's sake in the NBA of a 15-man roster of 30 teams is 450 people divvying up 51% of $6 billion. And for the NFL, it's 53 players, so you know it's a little less than four times as much and divvying up twice as much money. So the math just doesn't work out. And, and for the NFL, I think it's between 47 and 48% uh, that they get of revenue. Uh, Nick, if, if – Andrew Luck or Derek Carr or Khalil Mack or insert monster player here demands a guaranteed contract. How do you think that would play, and could they pull it off? I mean, they absolutely could pull it off, but the tough thing is a lot of the great players in the NFL never make it to true free agency. So you can get whatever your leverage dictates. And are you telling me that any NFL team, if Andrew Luck or if um, – Aaron Rodgers got to true free agency that any NFL team wouldn't give them every dollar they had and probably give them their firstborn child to get that guy there. So they could certainly get a, a, a fully guaranteed contract. I'm not sure that they would ever let the players get there. And since the game is as dangerous as it is, when you get a, a big number slid across the table to you and you have a couple years left on your deal, you're going to take that number. So I think that's the challenging part about getting fully guaranteed contracts in the NFL. It's obviously something that is, is not prohibited. They can do it at any point And a great deal of their contracts are guaranteed. But if any player, I mean, you named all the big name guys, Vaughn Miller, you if you imagine that any any of them actually reach true free agency, but I mean, I think that's the big problem with the franchise tag, why players hate it so much, because that's what keeps them from true free agency. I think Cousins is the guy that we should be watching because he's going to get the true free agency because a third year franchise would be quite cost prohibitive for the Redskins to do so. And I mean, one more point about the sports and, and the percentages. I'll, I'll look back into it and double check, but um, the Major League Baseball doesn't have a salary cap, as everyone knows, but I believe the percentage of revenue that, that, they, that goes to the players is less than both basketball and football. So it's kind of counterintuitive how we talk about these things, about how much money is going to the players, and we assume that the salary cap uh, is always, or not having a salary cap always benefits benefits all the players but what it actually does is benefit the high-end players and the lower-end players get squeezed so i'm certainly a proponent of eliminating the salary cap but it's important to understand that there's a bunch of different mechanisms that operate within the cba other than just a kind of a hard salary cap number it's a really interesting point we have hembo looking that up for you right now so we'll have the answer in just a minute in the meantime dominique we were both struck mike and i were both struck by the number of nfl players that over this past holiday weekend when all this money was getting thrown out to basketball players all these NFL players saying, hey, our sport makes more money. Why do we make so much less money? Why is there so much less for football players than there is for basketball players? Again, as a former leader of the union and a former NFL player for a long time yourself, what was your reaction when you saw all these football players having that reaction to the NBA money? Yeah, I just, um, as the president of the union at one point, and obviously is still, I worked in the NBA Players Association. The tough thing is when everyone has all this, uh, 
vim and vigor and they're all fired up during these situations, that needs to carry over to negotiations, to CBA negotiations, because you can have whatever you want if you're willing to sacrifice, because it comes down to the 11th hour in all negotiations, and many people mischaracterize how negotiations work, and they think that if you get a fast-talking lawyer or somebody who, ha- who knows some good tricks, that you can somehow trick the owners. No, that's not how, that's not how CBA negotiations work. CBA negotiations are come down to the 11th hour, and it's it's two groups sitting across the table and attempting to call each other's bluff. And if the owners ever get to the point that they believe that the that the players would seriously strike or they would be able to maintain their financial well-being throughout the course of an entire season if they were locked out, I guarantee you that the owners will um, relent on any hard position that they have. But the owners have so much more um, leverage and power because right. they are billionaires who have a lot more influence in the media and elsewhere. So it's a tough thing. I mean, there's a We've talked about this before, I think, just the power asymmetry between sports unions and, um, and, and leagues and owners because most of the players, especially in the NFL, they, uh, they turn over players so quickly. Whereas there is, So you end up facing a union that has uh, a small group of 20 to, to 50 stars in the league and then uh, some journeymen, but mostly like guys who are in their first contract and they are not willing, nor would it be um, logical necessarily for them to – to uh, participate in a strike or a lockout and forego a complete season or a large chunk of their earnings because their average careers are only three years. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's tough. It's a tough position for the union and the players to be in. But I think the players need to remember this the next time the CBA comes up because you can have what you want. You can get 60% of revenue. You can get 70% of revenue if you are willing to sacrifice what it takes to get there. Right. And really, that's the issue. It's always exactly. really insightful. And by the yep. way, you had it right. According to Hembo, players' salaries account for roughly 40% of total Major League Baseball revenue. The exact percentage varies from year to year, but it has been trending down in recent years. So yep. you have that I, right. I wasted that. I was... I was researching it for a story that I was writing because I was thought it was going to be big and shocking, and then I just wasted it on the radio. You guys Hardly. tricked me. Hardly at all. That was outstandingly well <laughs> done. And again, always insightful. Thanks a million, Dominique. Thanks, we'll see Dominic. you soon. All right, guys. Thank you. Very, yeah, we, we, really interesting. Yeah, we could have done all that on the first topic. We wanted to get to that topic because he and I fundamentally completely disagree on on the – the responsibility. I, I just, as he said, maybe I'm too much of a bleeding heart. I'm, I'm maybe a little more the other way. I mean, how many chances do you need before all of a sudden it's not? I would never sit here and say ESPN's responsible for getting me better if I choose to do, you know, smoke weed and get busted for it. I, I just, I don't buy it. I, I don't, I don't think there's enough personal acceptance for what's going on, and too many people think some, everybody else should help you and solve the problem. Okay, so it's a, it's a, look, it's a conversation that certainly can continue here. We will, and we've got um, next question and a whole lot more still to come on a very busy morning. No, it's fill in the blank. Fill in the blank, which is coming up next, which is a, a distinction without a difference, really, yeah. for, <laughs> <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Yes, it is. Home isn't just a place. It's a feeling. Whether you're at home, your business, or online, ADT helps keep you safe. With security systems, home automation, alarms, and surveillance. So you can feel at home, wherever you are. Go to ADT.com to get that feeling. ADT. Home. Safe. Home. Hey, everyone. Mike Golick here. Support for the Mike and Mike podcast comes from our friends at Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Chances are you're confident when it comes to your work, your hobbies, your life. Rocket Mortgage gives you that same level of confidence when it comes to buying a home or refinancing your existing home loan. Rocket Mortgage is simple, allowing you to fully understand all the details and be confident you're getting the right mortgage for you. To get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash mics. Equal housing lender, licensed in all 50 states, NMLS, consumeraccess.org number 3030. I just, I struggle. I can't get Paul Feinbaum's name right. Yeah. I can't see the word Feinbaum written and not call it Feinbaum. I know. B-A-U-M is, I mean, I'm from New York. It's Feinbaum. Louisville, the pronunciation of Louisville, Louisville. throws me all the time. Ooh. Yeah, you can't move Don't your lips. Don't move your lips. And then this one is what again? War. Just think war. War. Gin. Gin. Owski. Owski. War Gin Owski. War Gin Just go. I can't do it. <laughs> I don't know why. 
I'm struggling. You are listen, struggling. I respect the guy enormously. Oh, yeah, I know you do. He's a phenomal insider. Yeah, he was great with like us yesterday. Guy. You just can't say his name. I'm just going to go with Woj. Everyone calls him Woj. Woj. Right? If all his stories are Woj bombs, I'm just going listen, with Woj. let me handle the words. I speak gooder than you, you so do. let me There's do no that. There's no question. You've always talked more goodly than yeah, me. Yes, I have. So let's get back to that. Okay, I, 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 go ahead. R- real quick, on a side note about D'Angelo Williams, he was fantastic in wrestling. Yeah. With his WWE, did you see him? I did not. I know Holy he was doing smokes. it. smokes. That was his first time, correct? Am I? He was great. Now, I know he wants to go play football and such, but, boy, he looks good as well. Again, if I could ever be in public and just have my shirt off all the time, I, I would, uh, but I can't. But, man, he was – I got to give him way – we can disagree about what he was talking about uh, as far as the, uh, the testing in the NFL, but, man – and I love the wrestling, and he did a great job. Let, let, let's say this, okay? Let, let's let's con- let's not contribute to the incivility that has unfortunately become the public discourse in America now. Okay, there are two separate angles, as far as I'm concerned, to the employer's responsibility <laughs> right. for an employee that has an issue of some sort. One of them is the legal responsibility. That may vary state to state. It may vary company to company, what's in the contracts and all that kind of stuff. I honestly don't know. So let's put that aside. Then let's deal with what I think you're talking about, which is the moral side of it, the ethical side of it. And you know what? You can have your perspective, and he can have his. Absolutely. Neither one of you is wrong. No, you're Doesn't right. make you a bad guy or him a bad guy. You look at the same situation differently. Mm-hmm. Let's not make it out like one person is evil because you view this differently. Right. Here's the way I would put it, because I think that my perspective would be somewhere in between the two. And that is, in a general sense... I think we all have a responsibility to help other people if we can, right? I mean, if I can help you, no matter what the circumstances are, whether I'm your employer, your friend, or whatever it is, if I can be of help to you, then, then there's, there's some human obligation in a civilized society to provide that help. There is, however, also, I fully understand and appreciate a limit once we're getting into a professional environment right, here right. where – a, 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 if, if I am your boss, mm-hmm. I'm just going to say this is now requiring of me time, energy and effort that is is disproportionate to what I feel is is my responsibility, my right. obligation here. You know, and at some point, if you can't do this on your own with whatever, there is a level at which I've provided as much help right. as makes sense for me to help. I, I completely agree with that. And I, every, every person's line everybody's of that is t- going to be a little different. Every person's time frame is different. Yes. I'm, I'm, there's no doubt I am more of the, listen, you've had opportunities. You keep blowing these opportunities. At some point, you're done here. And when you're done here, you know what? Then you move on to the next phase of your life, and, and others can help you. Is it still my responsibility if you've, if you've blown it so many times, whether it be one time at a company or six times and you're done, you know, while you're there and if you get in trouble and if you're suspended, there's help being offered. And Dominique brings up what kind of help is being offered, what kind of uh, counseling, be it from the NFL or the PA. That I don't know. Is it all good enough uh, to try and help? That I don't know. But everything should be offered while you're, I agree, part of that organization or part of the league. But once you take it to the point of you're not in the league anymore, you've blown this too many times. You, again, you, because you did it, personal accountability, which I don't think is done enough in this country, and, and that's what starts to rub me the wrong way, is why we want to tell everybody else what they're doing wrong because you have the problem. So that that's the part that irks me the most. And then we can get into what's the time limit for all this, how much help should be given to, to a point where you have to just say, enough's enough, done all I can. You're not in this business, whatever it is anymore. Somebody else going to have to help you now. Right. We've done all we can. But to be clear, all we're doing is figuring out where that line is. Because right. I know you don't think the first time a player gets popped, the team should just, the league should wash their Absolutely hands. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So it's not. somewhere between that yeah. and forever. But six times? <laughs> right. So the answer is somewhere in between. Yes. Right? That's that's what the answer to this is. It's somewhere in between. Maybe where it is now is just fine. Maybe, we're, I mean, how many players does this actually wind up impacting? I can think of two off the top of my head. Martavis Bryant got suspended for a year. Right. And Josh Gordon got Basically banned, I think, for life with ability for you know. Come back, it got denied. The for, to try and come back, he got denied. And there've probably been others that I'm, I'm not jumping into sure, my head, right? but sure, it's sure. not like this happens to ten guys a year. No. So the system as it is isn't totally broken. 
Um, now, there are other circumstances in which players can be suspended in which they're not allowed to be at the facility. Right. Like Tom know, Brady wasn't allowed to be at the facility. There, there's, there's PEDs. PEDs are treated differently, right. uh, like what Tom The Brady was, thing. Right. Yeah. So, so, yes, there are different situations, but we were talking specifically. That's why we were referencing specifically the recreational drugs that D'Angelo Williams was talking about uh, and, and, and the responsibility, which, which I, I – it just seems too common sense to me that the responsibility first starts with the person ingesting it. I mean, am I just ridiculous? No, no. In thinking, I don't that? think anyone disagrees with that. But the point is that addiction to substances is a legitimate I problem. Completely agree with that. Completely agree. And the one guy we've had on the show many times was part of the show was Chris Carter, of course, who's the only one of the three of us that could really speak to, you know, need. And and I remember him saying there, it, as far as the help, I don't, you know. You may think, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, that he would be more along the lines of Dominique Foxworth, who Dominique said of himself, I may be too much of a bleeding heart for this. I, I remember Chris Carter saying, there needs to be consequences for, for what you do. Now, again, where's the range of that and the level of help that somebody needs if you are addicted to something? Look, CC said in his Hall of Fame speech... He thanked Buddy Ryan for yes. cutting him. Yes. Because it was the thing that woke him up. That's what and look, Buddy, you were his teammate I in was Philly his teammate. when he had all the talent in the world and couldn't escape oh, the problem. Listen, I'm in, he goes to Minnesota, and I'm watching him play and going, my God, I wish I had that. I'm sure he did as well, wishes he didn't go through what he went through. But, but he's right. He credits Buddy for making it tough love. You're not here anymore because everything here is leading to you doing bad things, so get out of here. And hopefully you will get save yourself here. And he did. He turned out to have a Hall of Fame career. And so, again, not to state the obvious, but to be clear, Chris, he wasn't waking up those days saying, you know, I think I'm going to go out and ruin my life today. No, no. I think I'm going to go out and, and ruin my, my professional life today, my career. That's not the way this stuff works. I, I'm not expert enough in it to know exactly I, how it works, I'm but it certainly either. isn't that. I'm not either of what's the addictive, what's not. I, I am not either. But I... I I just think sometimes accountability gets lost in this too much. I agree. I think that there, there, there there's a, a point to which there should be help provided, yeah. an opportunity for redemption provided, right. Right. and then at some point that ends. Right. And everyone's definition of where that some point is, I guess, is what we're really arguing over. Okay, Kevin, for the grand prize of $1 million, what color is the White House? Um, I know this. I know this. I know this. Um, five seconds. Oh, switching to Geico could save you a bunch of money on car insurance? Okay. Judges? That's true, Kevin. Bill and Owen, congratulations. You're a winner. Woo! Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Quick uh, uh, correction. D'Angelo Williams, it was Impact Wrestling, not WWE. So it was okay. Impact Wrestling. Either way. He did a fantastic job in the ring. Forgive so, my total you. ignorance. Is that is that I I don't the actual don't. wrestling like you would describe? Or, no, 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 or, no, 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 no. This is this is like WWE. It's in Got the it. ring. Yeah, he was it finished off. Some guy was laying on a table. So no, it's not the wrestling that I. <laughs> okay. I <did. laughs> so uh, what was this? The yeah. guy's name? Uh, uh, oh, his name just jumped out of my head. The superstar that we always reference, who's the greatest wrestler of all. Dan time. Gable. He never did that. No, no. And the other one, the younger. Every guy. time you do that, no, Dan younger, Gable gets madder one? and know, madder. That's and why I must never see you. Dan he Gable. Did. You ever see him? He is going to pop you. Yes, which I don't need. And I am not going to stop him. He's the greatest wrestler of all time. I'm me. That's not a very good yeah. fight. Yeah, you just. I don't know who's why. I'm you thinking are. of more recently who never lost. Kale Sanderson. Kale Sanderson is the yeah. other one I was thinking of. Okay, Mike and Mike, let's fill in the blank. That's brought to you by Mahindra Tractors and Utility Vehicles. Mahindra USA, the world's number one selling tractor. The staff has put together some sentences and conveniently left out a word. And it's our job to fill that in. Here we go. First, the most significant player to switch teams so far in the NBA offseason has been blank. To switch teams... I'll say Gordon Hayward again. I'm going to stick with that to see where it goes because I, I don't think Paul, George, or Chris Paul will be with their respective teams after next year. A, I, I think a close second or maybe even first, I, I, Jimmy Butler is another one. I, I, I think what could be going on in Minnesota, the only reason I give it to, to Hayward over Butler is Butler's still now in the West, and the West is a tall, tall order. And, you know, now in Boston where Gordon Hayward is and what they're going to try and build there, we may see the fruits of their labor sooner. Yeah, there's a lot of different ways to parse the word significant, but I will go with Butler because I think Minnesota is the team to really ascend. I think if you look at every team in the NBA right now and say which one will win 
which one will have the greatest increase in total wins next season? The two you'd look at are Philadelphia, if those guys stay right, healthy, right. and Minnesota. And Minnesota, you're right. I think they should get much, much better, and Butler will be a big part of that. Next, Clayton Kershaw not being available to pitch in the All-Star game is? A shame, but not that big a deal. I mean, it's a shame. I would love to see him pitching his inning or possibly two. I'd love to see him throw against Aaron Judge. I agree that would be a great matchup, but I don't think there's anybody out there who was going to turn on the game that is not going to turn it on because he's not pitching. And I don't think they were, you were going to get that incredible influx of casual fan, oh, my God, Clayton Kershaw is pitching, so I'm going to make sure I tune in. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to say a shame, and I'm not going to add the other part that you added. I do think it's a shame. I think in baseball showcase event, it would be great to have its showcase star pitching the first inning. And, and you know what? Maybe some people would watch that and get excited about it. It creates a memorable moment. Maybe strikes out the side in the first inning. Maybe strikes out Aaron Judge in a memorable at bat. You know, the All-Star game is about moments. It, it wasn't intended to be about home field advantage in the World Series. It was intended to be about about moments he might have he would have had a chance to give us one or some and to me it's a shame that he won't be there next Jameis Winston invited the hard knocks crew to his 6 a.m. off-season workouts with his trainer that is blank getting ahead of the game I mean listen they're going to be on hard knocks they're going to be filmed he's going to be filmed more than anybody so he's accepting that and he's you know embracing it and saying let's start doing some of it right now so I I I'm fine with that. I agree. I, mean, I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with it at all. I know some people on the staff sent out a note that said if J.J. Watt did this, everyone would be making fun of him. But J.J. Watt does 3 a.m. videos, and we're used to that from J.J. Watt, so it would just be like, oh, J.J. Watt's just continuing to do that. I, so I totally agree. Yeah. I have no problem with it either. Next, Rory McIlroy banning himself from social media is blank. Awesome. And the way he did it, gave his wife the phone, changed the password, don't give it back to me. He realized he shouldn't have hit send with what he did to Steve Elkington when they were kind of going back and forth. He said he wrote it out, what, four or five times, kept deleting it, and then finally hit send, and he shouldn't have. So he banned himself. I, I think that's just hilarious. I, I I actually didn't have any problem with what he tweeted. So I love the banning. I love the way he did yeah, it. It's very yeah. creative. It is. But I didn't have any problem whatsoever with him firing back. He's not firing back at just some random person who criticized him. He's firing back at a member of the fraternity. He's responding directly right. to yeah, Elkington. Yeah. So I didn't have any problem with I it whatsoever. I, did. I, I really didn't either. Finally, and this is probably a, a topic that we should yep. spend a little more time in depth on, the University of Texas having a beer sponsor is blank. No big deal. It is, I believe, the first time that the, it's Corona, and it's the first time that any major university's pr a sports program has had as a presenting or as a sponsor an alcohol. And I know company. there are a lot of tentacles that is all oh, more money for the school, no more money for the players. And that, that's that's a discussion that we obviously can have as they find another revenue stream. But as far as it being beer, that's a question. Well, I, I don't care. I mean, NFL teams make money off it. The league makes money off it. And you know what? It's still illegal for anyone under 21 to do. We know kids in college drink. That isn't changing anything by them. All of a sudden, Texas having a sponsor doesn't have every college student saying, well, it's still illegal for us to drink, but now it isn't because we have a sponsor. So I don't, I don't think it changes anything, and they found another revenue stream. Again, I understand the other arguments that can come from this, that they're making more money. Why can't some go into the players? We can absolutely have that discussion. But I know the main thing of this question is actual having a beer company as a sponsor for college. Colleges are selling beer. At, at their college games. More and more of them yeah, are, so yeah. They're, they're doing that and, and getting a, a better revenue stream for that. So now they have a sponsor. I don't have an issue with it. Yeah. You know, I think I don't either. Um, I think it is a bigger topic. I understand some people having an issue with the optic of it, um, just in that, you know, now you are attaching this sponsorship to these players, many directly to yeah. them, many of whom are not old enough to drink. Mm -hmm. um, are you tacitly encouraging drinking amongst underage people and all that kind of stuff. But my general honest response is the same as yours. Th this is just another way of making money. 
that ship has long since passed, yep. whether it's Corona's money or anybody else's money that they're making. I have a host of issues with the way the players are or aren't compensated or allowed to take advantage of their likeness on the college level. Right. This doesn't actually no. change it for me no. that much. I am, however, open to hearing a really good, solid argument on the other side. That's something let's do tomorrow. No, I agree with that. Yeah. If someone is a real – I'm open to having someone say, no, Greeny, what you're not thinking of is yeah. this. Here's the reason why it's a bad idea. Yeah. So I'm open to that. I mean, I, I'm obviously right about the whole LeBron banana boat thing. No, you're year. not. You know who I want to hear from about this Texas thing? Mitch. Mitch. Yeah, of course. Mitch, and use small words for, you know, the people like me. We'd appreciate that. See you on the golf course, Mitch. See you tomorrow. Mitch. You're listening to Love Advice with Leanne. Caller, you're on the air. Uh, hi, Leanne. Long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why, in your professional opinion, do you never take my calls off the air? Is this Carl? Yep, it's Carl. I mean, we had a few dates. Everything was great, I thought. Uh... Well, you know, when you switch to GEICO, you could save a lot of money on car insurance. Okay, awesome. You should call them. I will. GEICO, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer.